Hello and welcome to the NixiePod podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Velvet, a quantum intuitive coach, teacher, and filmmaker sharing authentic spiritual stories. I deep dive into life's mysteries and magic by interviewing amazing people that have followed their calling. Each episode serves to spark something in your soul. Kelly, it is so good to be speaking to you again. Uh, Kelly is a depth astrologer and she speaks the mythic language of the stars. She's also an astromythologist and she writes and teaches her life work on archetypal psychology, cosmology and psychospirituality with her special interest in the cosmic feminine. She's authored books such as Living Lilith, Four Dimensions of the Cosmic Feminine, Black Moon Lilith, and her latest creative endeavor, which I love, it brings so much innocence into your work, is the Planetary Gods and Goddesses coloring book. I love that because sometimes mythology can be quite a heady subject. Yes. Oh, that was a really fun project. Um, I got into some of my latest research, which we'll get into, I'm sure. I'm sure we will. So let's get to depth astrology. What what is depth astrology? I, I read that you wrote astrology is not so much about predicting the future as it is looking deeply into current cycles and the present moment in relation to your experience and purpose in life. I love that you go into the cycles of that because that's really how astrology works for people. So how does that look when you're doing a reading for someone? Well, you know, people think astrology is about prediction, and I think that is limiting and also a bit worrying, <laughs> you know, that, you know, that uh, some astrologies are predictive, and that can be useful, but on a general basis, and I uh, do have that psycho-spiritual orientation to my work, you know, we people want to know, like, what is going on with me? And uh, astrology can really help look into that moment, the moment of what's going on now, yeah. Uh, how the planetary cycles, both the shorter ones and the longer ones, are impacting you. And when you're having a specific visitation, that archetype just walks into your life. And so that's good to know. And uh, so it's looking deeper into the moment. And the, the phrase depth astrology comes from my background in depth psychology, which is a mythic approach uh, and use of, of mythology as a way of thinking about our lives and the universal myths that really have so much to do with human meaning in uh, the bigger term and that we are all living our mythology. Yeah, I guess you can see that so clearly in a chart. I mean, the astrologers that I've been to and when I when I studied astrology, we didn't bring in those uh, those dwarf planets and and far out planets that uh, that bring in the mythology, uh, a deeper mythology into it, which is so interesting because we really can connect with those to further understand mm -hmm. our lives. Yeah, so we have the classical planets and they're the ones we can see so easily in the sky and and then we discovered uh, the outer planets, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, only in the last several centuries. And then uh, there were more asteroids being discovered, a whole belt of these thousands, millions maybe, of small rocky bodies between Mars and Jupiter. And now, just since the new millennium, we've been discovering more Plutos, <laughs> more, more uh, small icy bodies. And right. Pluto is right on the front edge of what we call the Kuiper belt, which goes uh, way out into the solar system. And they're uh, discovering new little bodies there. Some of them have moons, all these different worlds. And at first they started naming them for um, underworld gods like Pluto. So there's some of them that are named uh, for an Etruscan god, Orcus, or um, a Greek figure, Radamanthus, or some more like that. But when we have more and more being discovered, they decided they needed a new category and they work with mythology, the astronomers, however they channel these names, it's very interesting. So they started to uh, name them for indigenous creator gods from around the world. Right. I found it absolutely fascinating, isn't it? It is super fascinating and fascinating how that then affects us 
on Earth. Those that we discover, these planets, give them a name and then they somehow play into our lives. How does that work? That's a mystery, isn't it? <laughs> it is a mystery because they really do. They really do play into people's lives and the cycles of us on Earth so beautifully. Well, even the classical planets we see were given names and their mythology was largely written or told around yeah. how they move through the sky. That's a uh, very obvious with the myth of Inanna from ancient Sumeria. Uh, Inanna was Venus, is Venus. And so it describes, her whole myth describes how Venus moves through the sky and how it disappears at certain points and uh, how sometimes it's an evening star and sometimes it's a morning star. So we can look at it that way with these new discoveries. And even with the outer planets, Uranus, Neptune, and, and Pluto, that is now, you know, considered in the Kuiper belt, um, the mythology gave rise to some thoughts about that, to how our experience reflects these larger universal mythic stories. And again, give more meaning to our lives. So there are these new mythologies that we're being introduced to that is, is thrilling. And that's why I did the coloring book mainly. It was my initial research into the Kuiper belt objects. I call them the KBOs. And yes. um, they're also referred to as trans-Neptunian objects, TNOs. <laughs> so these KBOs, um, you know, it has extended our mythic roster well beyond the, the Greco-Roman. And I think that is very healthy for the global yes. consciousness that we are gaining now and to introduce us to indigenous cultures who carry such traditional wisdom through the ages. There and is so much wisdom in them. And I love what they bring through. It's, uh, it's super interesting. Yes, um, it really is. <laughs> yeah, so I see also um, one of the other things that I saw that you wrote is um, about these KBOs, these deep space, um, mostly dwarf planets. Um, I intuit that these new celestial neighbors operate from a higher dimension, perhaps a quantum level, engaging implications of increasing alignment of science and spirituality. How beautiful. Are these planets coming online as we as we start to recognize them and see them and, and uh, give them the, these these mythologies? Yes, another good question, Nikki. Because <laughs> were they there before we saw them? <laughs> you know, and how long have they been there? Sometimes I think they're spaceships from other you know star systems that have come in for our times, but you know that that's a bit of fantasy or imagination. But you know, mythic. Language is a language of the imagination of imagery that can become meaningful to us. We, we work with the imagery, you know, in our lives and the creator God and goddess aspect of these uh, newly named objects uh, evoke even more of a, of a, a dimension of uh, manifesting of, of the original creators Yes. Take from the, you know, some idea, some form, some imagination, some vision, and they pull that into manifestation, they create it. And so this is a different level of consciousness. Even when astronomers discovered the outer planets and astrologers were starting to work with them, considering that we don't see them physically, we need a telescope to see Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. It, it represented something about the larger collective consciousness uh, that is unseen, that we work with, you know, on an inner dimension. It's not so obvious like the planets we can see in the mm. sky that have more to do with our personal lives or our social lives, perhaps. But these outer planets are like these other dimensions of, um, of consciousness that have to do with... Um, with generational themes. You're in this yeah. space 84 years to go around the sun, seven years in each zodiac sign. 
Neptune's about twice as far as that, 165 years, 14 years in a sign. And Pluto has an unusual orbit. Sometimes it's quite farther away and it comes closer. So it can be in a sign from 12 years to 30 years. Oh, wow. So these planets define generations of people. So yes. you have your Uranus generation that you're working with in awakening something right. to do with the sign your Uranus is in and the same with Neptune and Pluto. So when we get to this new Kuiper belt, that's another dimension of consciousness as well. Right. And because and those the, take longer cycles. Yes. Yes. Well, Pluto is 248 years and um, one that was discovered fairly early on, Eris, E-R-I-S, the goddess of discord. <laughs> she, oh. she, her orbits 500 and something. Right. So we have them, you know, taking quite a while. And then there's one been discovered that's even farther out than the Kuiper belt called Sedna, who's the goddess who lives at the bottom of the Arctic Sea. Oh. And her orbit is about 12,000 years around wow. the sun. So that's very, very far out. <laughs> yeah, that is very interesting because it, it, it plays in with, uh, you know, the uh, procession and things like that, that the earth is going through in the earth's own cycles as well. Yeah. Um, some, you know, the numbers all interconnect in some way. Well, that's yeah. a good point too, to mention the earth because the earth is one of these planets going around the sun. So this is our family. This is our solar yeah. system family that's been expanding out now to these farther reaches of consciousness. So what it does reflect is these discoveries reflect that we are in the process of moving into a new dimension of consciousness and that this is now accessible to us and that we have these pinpoints, you know, we can kind of uh, find, you know, which particular storyline is, is the one that we can work with the most closely in our lives, depending on where it is in our charts, and then follow them, track them around, you know, the, the, in terms of the current planetary cycles. Right. So how would that look if you're looking at it in someone's chart? How would someone work with uh, some of these deep space uh, planets or uh, objects and um, and how would that how would it look in in someone's chart? It sure has a lot more um, mythic uh, storylines to follow. It can look like it can look. There's so many more things you can put in a chart. You know, astro astrologers are using asteroids, and there's so many of those. And now yeah. we have the KBOs, and some people say, I just can't deal with it. It's too much. But I'm just finding it so thrilling, so compelling, partly because of the, you know, indigenous stories and yeah. that it's global. So the thing is, um, they are indigenous creator gods and goddesses. And I think we need to be very respectful of what that mythology is and not be too quick to make interpretations of them based on our mindset. I think we need to let these creator gods and goddesses talk to us. Yes. And so I have been very slow and careful as much as I can remember to be um, when I'm looking at these in people's charts. So, um, so for instance, um, uh, Nikki, I know that you are a uh, Virgo. Yes. You have your son at the very end of Virgo. And just across the line into Libra, you have the Kuiper Belt object named Haumea. I love Haumea. <laughs> Haumea is the Hawaiian goddess of childbirth. And it's not just childbirth, but she gives birth to everything. She is the creatress. So she uh, gives birth to all the plants and animals and everything, you know, uh, including humans. And um, Haumea as an astronomical object is shaped like an egg. So it is kind wow. of like, a, like almost like a pregnant belly of a woman. And yeah. there are two moons. So some of these Kuiper Belt objects have moons, 
yes. which is pretty astounding actually so they were gives more color to the to the myth and yes, the story it does and you know like um jupiter has like 60 something moons now we keep discovering more and more and saturn more and more too that's almost like they're having a race who can have more moons <laughs> jupiter always stays ahead somehow because he is king of the gods so that their moons and these icy objects out there is pretty amazing and even to take the example of pluto pluto's first moon discovered charon is half the size of pluto and they go around each other in this kind of uh like dance dancing mm -hmm. in the distance dark here and so it's considered by some to be a binary planet and that is true of some of the kbo's not so much of haumea though because her moons her two moons are you know pretty small i mean yes. the kuiper belt objects are small on their own and then you get these little tiny moonlets you know yeah so her moons are named he iaka who's the hula dance goddess beautiful and Namaka, that is a very powerful water goddess. I mean, she is, I think of her as a mermaid, but the power of her, you know, to stir up storms and throw water at the lava that's coming down from the volcano and cooling it off is yeah. uh, pretty powerful. And although there's not a moon named for this daughter of Haumea, Pele, the volcano goddess, is her daughter too. Huh. So she is, she gives birth to, you know, plants and fruits and fish and everything. So she is, she is the original creatrix. Yes. She is in, so if she is in aspect to some of the planets in your personal chart, then, then you would be looking at creativity and birthing new ideas or understandings or new things actual yes, tangible yes. things what, depending what, on where what, she is in your chart exactly what do you give birth to yeah and that's one of my questions that i you know i think about with almea like how do you decide what to give birth to <laughs> <laughs> you know right. like, as a woman how do how do her eggs decide what semen to let in you know kind of thing yeah, yeah. And I love that you said that because it's like her decision. It's not. It's not some random thing that happens. That there's there's some consciousness behind this. Well, I think to, to some extent that is absolutely true. Is it that she wants to make something beautiful in the world? Does she want to bring more food for people to eat, or is it just this, you know, this huge surge of creative energy that's just welling up from deep inside her? or all three you know yeah but i think i think that plays out all three in, at different times and i try to be as conscious as possible around there you it go. see you're teaching yeah. us about how maya and how you <laughs> live it because it's so close to your sun sign yeah the yeah. sun sign represents your life path and and so how maya is very uh close to you know your life path and she's one of your guides so your creative verve and um, how you do that, it's in the sign of Libra and it's in a sign for quite a while. So yeah. actually um, it was in Libra from, let's see, I've got this little table here because I've, I've mapped it all out. So going back a bit, actually, Haumea was in Leo from 1926 and it takes her a couple of years to transition up yes. to 1958 into 60. And then in Virgo from 58, 60 into 1992-ish, right around in there. And then, then went into Libra and she's still in Libra. This is like 2022. We're talking here in July of 2022. And yes. she's just at the far edge of Libra. And she's actually going to change sign and go into Scorpio for the first time in November of this year. Oh, wow. I wonder how that will feel for me <laughs> or for anyone, because it's going to bring a change possibly of how you are creating. Because Libra is very balanced, loves to be um, uh, speak to lots of people have lots of friends and have balance in your life and then scorpio is, has this depth to it yes um, it can be very spiritual as well 
Yeah, so all the signs are spiritual yeah. uh, on their own and mundane as well. Uh, so I think of it this way too. You know, when I came up with that quote, with that question, like how does how may I decide? I realized, well, she's in Libra right now, and that is a sign of decision. And yes. it's like weighing things, right? Balancing out, you know. And it's also a sign of relationship, as you were s- suggesting. And so maybe she likes to create in relationship, in partnership. And perhaps she is creating partnerships and liaisons, you know, in this uh, last, you know, since uh, the early 90s here. So that's just some ways to think about it. And in Scorpio, there's that creative passion and intensity. No decision, just like let the energy, you know, like move through you. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I think of it as a very erotic sign eros being the god who came out of chaos with the earth you know in that desire to be so it's the desire a really strong desire that that seems to be uh you know creating a new um and so that that should be interesting you know when haumea moves into scorpio in november of 2022 and then it goes back a bit, and then it goes back into Scorpio, I think by the summer of 2023. So, uh, or some, maybe it, I have to look it up. <laughs> but yeah, so so she is moving. Time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it, there's this time to really feel the change is coming, and then you can go back into kind of what you're used to, but with the thought of, of how it's going to change and go back into yeah, it. Exactly. It another taster. Yeah, it's yeah. like this new energy. And then it goes back to say, okay, well, I need to decide something else or rebalance in order to really enter this energy. And, yeah. and interestingly, she's changing sign at, at the same time as the planet Pluto is. Mm. So Pluto's at the end of Capricorn, which has uh, there it's been since 2008, kind of you know, Pluto is very transformational and it, yes. it kind of brings things up and then we have to let go. So right. all of the Capricorn systems and structures that we've been living under, especially those that don't serve or respect the earth. Yes. Capricorn is an earth sign. And it is a sign that is about tradition and traditional peoples who know for so long how to live with the earth in respect. I've got goosebumps. We're having to kind of relearn that and get back to that because, you know, there's been a a lot of damage and we haven't lived in that kind of harmony. So all these systems and structures and goodness, what we've been through the last few years is like the bridge has burned behind us and Pluto makes that pretty obvious. Yeah, we really are getting rid of the old structures that aren't serving us. Yeah. And also some of the underlying structures that are more traditional, some of the special places that you've been filming and where the earth energy comes into alignment with the cosmos, that too is, I think, part of the, you know, exposing what has been hidden for so long or, yeah. or lost in terms of the knowledge of the how how special the you know heaven to earth connection is and how it's guided people for so long yeah and also our, as our consciousness is coming into a new consciousness as we were speaking with uh, Hamir and the different some of the other planets and and how we're able to see these things that have been sometimes mm. hidden in plain sight Yes, really. So Pluto um, steps into Aquarius for the first time in in, uh, March of 2023. And so as Palmea is changing sign from Libra to Scorpio, Pluto is changing sign from Capricorn to Aquarius. And in the circle, those two positions are 90 degrees apart, making a, a right angle that in astrology is an activation. It's like not a smooth thing. It's like, okay, we got to do something here. Something's happening here. Let's step up. It's very motivating. Change is coming from both sides here. Like, how is this going to happen? So I think of it as, you know, here's, 
here's Pluto kind of coming in and taking down a lot of the structures and Haumea is is pregnant. She's giving birth and she's like the wave coming over the top of the undertow to kind of bring in something new. And thank goodness for Haumea at this time, because we, you know, can feel we can be actually witnessing and helping to create some of these new things that are going to be more sustaining and more um, meaningful in the changes and the new era that we're entering. Yeah, I think a lot of people are feeling that with all the changes that have been happening in our lives is is something more conscious. What is it? Where where are we going from here? And Hamir is a beautiful yeah. way forward with with her deep earth connection and her creativity, because that we are creative beings as humans. All yeah. of us, even if even people who don't feel that they're creative, we are all creative. I know. So people say, oh, I'm not an artist. And it's like we're all creators. We're yeah, we're creating our own lives. Sometimes we do that unconsciously and blindly, you know, but how may is a beautiful one because it's um one of the cosmic feminine energies. It's a, you know, female giving birth creator and women are the ones who give birth. So if we're giving birth to a new age, we need that feminine consciousness to come right. in and that's a and, consciousness and even, even that both men. men and women have yeah, yeah. were you about to say that's that say. <laughs> yeah. no, that's the feminine consciousness well. within men as well yes. yeah because we both Absolutely. have masculine and feminine consciousness Absolutely. and energies playing within us yes whether, whether you yeah. identify as a man or a woman yeah and that's that's also the a more balanced consciousness coming forward yes yes for sure yeah. So when I, you know, when I was doing my coloring book and studying all the, the myths and the background about the culture as well and uh, the people. And uh, so I just had a, a certain roster of them I was working with and I was bemoaning the fact that there were none saved from Africa. Ha ha. But now there is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> I was researching for my documentary and you wrote these articles on on this beautiful artvark woman yes yes artvark woman so i was so glad um apparently this object was discovered in 2007 but wasn't named until more recently like i think in 2019 and so i was so excited about this and and i get a lot of uh, information about the discoveries and the naming from a a galactic astrologer named Philip Sedgwick, who's an American astrologer who is very into like this, these deep space things and unusual aspects of astrology that can be very empowering. So he's been following these and reporting on these. So he, um, you know, he, he announced the naming and, you know, it is an African name from, from Namibia. Yes. So you want to give it a try? <laughs> uh Gunkomdima is the name of the artwork woman. Yes. Okay. I think so. We I I haven't got the the correct pronunciation from from my friend yet. Uh, but okay, I know it has a click like name. that. Something yes. like Gunkomdima. Gun, yeah. Gunkomdima. Gunkomdima. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, beautiful and. Um, yeah, there's some mythology about her. Um, and, you know, it, it, these creator gods come from the land. Hmm. So, you know, traditional peoples are very connected to the land. Yes. And so are the stories and the myths. So this is why, again, I'm very careful. Uh, you know, all I know is a few facts from the myth. Yes. I have no way at this point of unless I start inserting it in charts and talking to people who seem to relate to the myth. So what did you find out in, in your research about her? I didn't find out too much more than what I've read from what you have written. Um, what I was really interested in is that she is sometimes, so an art fark is a bit like an anteater. It comes from a different kind of genus but it looks like an anteater and it has this this long snout that um so with with uh, these uh, bushmen 
understanding sometimes the snake and the elephant that she also is seen as are interchangeable. So the snake and the elephant are, are often interchangeable in a story because the elephant has this long trunk and the snake ah, ah. the snake crawls along the ground. The snake is the snake is very much connected to the earth because her belly is always on the ground. And the um the art fark is right. also very connected to the earth because she burrows, she goes under the earth, which in my uh small understanding so far and, and growing always because it's always uh, an interest of mine that because the snake in so many indigenous stories is also seen as underground uh, she can go she can connect with with an underground world and the art fark also buries he uh, the they burrow under the ground and so in my understanding at the moment is that this idea of being able to burrow under the ground allows them to go into another world into into oh. the other worlds oh. um, and in consciousness as well it's almost like when you go into a deep meditation this is the other world that you can go into by burrowing under the ground so that she is connected as well with snake and with elephant mm -hmm. that is so wise um, mm. just gives her so much depth yeah, elephants are so earthy in themselves. Yeah. Yes, and they're, they're stomachs that rumble to communicate. Again, oh. the tummy. Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> oh, I like elephants are just amazing. So um Aardvark woman is also said to uh defend her people and punish wrongdoers. Actually, there are quite several of these KBOs that have that kind of theme, because it's when people go against the cosmic order and universal mm. law, you know, yes. and she uses um, spiny things from a particular bush. Yeah. Uses a rain cloud of hail and she uses the magical oryx horn mm. as uh, kind of a magic wand isn't that comes up to my imagination. Maybe that's not fair, but um, I love it. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like that unicorn horn <laughs> that's magical. Yeah, because it is a single uh, oryx or hempsbok, as we would call it in South Africa. Uh, yes. horn. So that is quite straight, feature. isn't it? Um, I I'm not sure. Um, it has a slight curve to it, but yeah, yeah they are quite I think great. it does. Uh-huh. Both males and females possess a pair of long lethal horns, narrow and slightly curved. Hmm. Yeah. But she has that one that, that she yeah. uses. Um, so that's another, you know, animal in that mythic story that uh is is relevant. Yeah, and she's, I've read in a, in a few different places that she's very beautiful as well. Yes. And that rem, it reminds me of a, of a Marvel movie. I mean, they could go to town with her. She would, <laughs> she would be, she would bring a lot of, a lot of uh, interest, I think. Oh, yeah, kind of Wonder <laughs> Woman, right? Yeah, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But again, the cultural sensitivity, you know, we want to maintain that and, um, and the, the honor of, Thank of you for saying that. that you know, of, of how that story came out of the ground itself. I love that, that visual. It really did because these cultures do live so close, so close to mother nature, to, to the earth. And they, they, they have this, in all these indigenous cultures, you look at them and you see how reverent they are. To the earth i mean you talk about mm -hmm. carbon footprint in our modern understanding and their carbon foot footprint in in all these indigenous cultures are are not just minimal but really in reverence and in accordance with mother earth it's it's almost like they are one being you know the yes. mother and the, and the being together creating together yes and they and honor that back you know they thank the creator and mm -hmm. and um one of my favorites uh, and uh, is Salacia, or mm. I say Salacia, but some people would say Salacia or okay. Salacia. And this goes back to the Greco-Roman mythology, but uh, Salacia is a mermaid 
who made the sunlight to sparkle on the sea. Oh. <laughs> How delightful. How delightful. Yes. <laughs> just beautiful and in some of the the sacred sites that i've uh, been following they they often look onto the ocean where the sun creates these spa a line of sparkles yeah. along the ocean so that's yeah it's it like a pathway you could walk yeah. across the pathway the sparkling pathway yes yeah. yes uh, i've heard it called the glitter path and mm, uh, I I also that. You know, like I live in Vermont, which is a very northern state. And when we have these beautiful blizzards <laughs> that settle down and leave a white, uh, like a thick white coat on the ground, you know, say the full moon that night is going to glitter on the snow. Mm. Or it could be sometimes we see glitters in the sky or we can think about and I think this is such an important thing for people to know that we are getting these huge waves of plasma, these photon waves. Photons are the little tiny subatomic particles that, that are light. Yes. And they, they flicker on and off in a kind of way, like they sparkle, they shimmer. And so we're getting huge waves of light from where we are in the galaxy right now. And so it's like, Selassie is just sparkling right down from this wave from the, the galaxy here. All the special light that many people feel is upgrading us as humans. Yes, it's a, a, it's a higher frequency of light. Yes. So yeah. we are yeah. being called to embrace this at a time when we have these new creator gods and goddesses, you know, coming in to also invite us into this new level of consciousness, which I think of as quantum, partly because I've been hearing that word everywhere lately. You know, yeah. there, there's a lot of quantum science going on and, you know, quantum consciousness has to go along or even precede the science. Yes, I love quantum science. It's a great interest of mine and, and some of the things that I do, like family constellations use that quantum science. So it's very, it's very close to my heart, that understanding. And I feel it's... Mm. You can't go ahead with science from my point of view, which is, you know, just my point of view without that, that quantum understanding, mm. it has also a larger, a larger perspective, um, mm -hmm. not just, not just in the head, but beyond into mm -hmm. cosmos, into something that's a little bit more magical sometimes because we don't understand it. Yes. Yes. It does seem rather magical and mystical in, in the etheric realm. Um, different cultures talk about ether as the fifth element out of which fire, air, earth, and water emerge, the physical mm. elements, that ether can be considered an element of consciousness, but it is right. also, they refer to um, non-physical ether and physical ether. So it, this might be the arena in which we do like get an idea, have an intention, have a vision, and then, you know, if we're really tuned in, we can just, it's like almost instant manifestation, depending on our level of consciousness and how yeah. centered or like, you know, in the center point we are, you know, mm. within ourselves, but also in alignment with the cosmos. Yes. So, so this, this feeling that Celestia is bringing into mm. us is this magical light that's coming in that we can actually create with its plasma that we can bring from light into plasma yeah. into something much yeah. more physical yeah and literally create mm -hmm. from our consciousness with this light plasma yes as our bodies are you know integrating this light and our light bodies are lighting up mm. you know so we are creating our new consciousness in a, in physical form. So it's changing our physicality in some way and lighting us up. I like that idea too. I love that idea. I love that. And it, and it comes back again to Halmia as well with the creating. Yes. So they all are, seem interconnected in some way. Well, they're in the same realm. And one of the beautiful yeah. things about Selassie's story is that you know, uh, so beautiful and delightful. How could Neptune, the king of the, the god of the sea, not fall in love with her? 
<laughs> you yes. know, but but Selassie is like, he's he's you know god of the sea you know he's just flirting he's not serious so she just she went off into another part of the ocean and neptune was like bereft and he sent a dolphin to find her and in i in the way i think about it the dolphin had a beautiful pearl to give her mm -hmm. and said no he really wants to marry you he wants to make you his queen so she went back and became neptune's queen and um, became queen of the mermaids, <laughs> so to speak. Oh. So the self honoring mm. in that in that story is is really beautiful, I think. And um, Celestia is in the sign of Aries right now. So okay. if you're an early Aries, hey. born in in March, you know, twenty first to the end of March, you're having a Celestia visitation. <laughs> Wonderful! Oh, I love that. Yeah, and if people want to know where their Celestia is, um, she was in Sagittarius from 1930 to 1949, hmm. and Capricorn from 49 to 71, Aquarius from 1971 to 94. Oh, that's me. <laughs> yeah, that's you. Yeah, in Aquarius. So that's going to light up the, the social context and groups and, you know, community uh and that's very important right now yes. um pisces from 94 to 2016 and now she's in aries until 2040 hmm. so that's uh that's this newness that's new light she's creating new light she's bringing yes. in new light and uh innovations aries is the trailblazer so mm -hmm. here's this light coming in waking us up and and opening new dimensions of consciousness for us to explore. Oh, that's just wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you for all this beautiful information and how you've brought it together in the understanding of cycles. Yes, yeah, that's what we live in, you know, these cycles and the choreography of these planetary cycles with these new additions now is just extraordinary it's it's just extraordinary and you know we do have these mythic representations now from all over the world from the rapa nui easter island from hawaii from um india from the inuit people uh from the uh, los angeles area indians from the iroquois people from the northeast us where i am from um, Lithuania, um, from China too. There's mm -hmm. a new one called Gong Gong. And uh, yeah, that, that's a, a pretty, a really wild myth. So it's so interesting and we're finding our own ways, you know, and these discoveries light up for us. So- mm -hmm. um, And if people yeah. wanna read a bit more about some of these, uh, mythologies that people that have been uh, put into some of the KBOs capable objects, they can go onto your website to to read about many of them. Yes, the ones that I've been, you know, studying enough to write about them, but I do have the coloring book that that has all the pictures and and here's oh, there the, it is. At. Yeah, here's the whole sky from the sun out. And here's the Kuiper belt. And there's so many more than I've included here. But but still, so th that's a fun way to get to know them. But my website, uh, heliastar.com, H-E-L-I-A-S-T-A-R.com. I have a whole section on, on the quantum solar system and astro mythology. And I also talk about my own work and my other special interest area, which is the cosmic feminine. So, uh, and we've just, we've been talking about part of that today with the, yes. the Kuiper belt objects. There are creator gods as well, but we were looking at the cosmic feminine today. Yes, thank you. And I'll, I'll put some of your links uh, below so that people can find you easily because there's just a, a world of, of mystery and interest and intrigue that people can actually use in their own lives as well that, that make what you're doing and what you what you want to be doing so much richer and, yes. and the understanding of where to go and the cycles of where you're at with all of these beautiful mm. indigenous creator gods and goddesses 
and and everything and all the others that come with it as well so thank you Alex. i've loved chatting to you today oh it's and great thank you talk for ages there's I so know. much people i know there really is <laughs> Yeah, I love talking astrology and and uh, and the myth. You know, it, it's a language of myth, and um, it's a language of the stars, and it's a language of the soul. So, I love doing this. If you enjoyed this episode, please write a review and rate the Nixie Pod Show. It helps to get this information out to more of our soul tribe. Thank you for listening.